Hello everybody, this is Jeff Neville for Selective Imagery. A while back I did a video called Thanks for the Memories. And even though it didn't get a lot of views, hey, I get back up on the horse when I fall down and it just happens to be a subject that I like talking about, that I like sharing. So I have a part two and I'm going to discuss some more vintage cameras that I own, uh, some that I recently purchased um, because I used to shoot these actual cameras back in the 70s up to, let's say, the year 2000, somewhere in that neighborhood. And I wanted to have uh, the cameras that I used in my youth. And they're all functional. Um, some, of them I got, some of them that I got were in very good, excellent condition already. Others I sent out and had uh, clean lubrication, lubrication and adjustments made to them along with calibrating the exposure meters. So they're all fully functional cameras and I'm going to have a lot of fun talking about them. So stay tuned. So now that you've seen the pictures, let's talk about this camera. 1962 Petri Blue Magic 35mm rangefinder. Petri was founded in 1907 and it made cameras and optics. It was a Japan camera company. Unfortunately, it filed for bankruptcy in 1977 because there were so many changes in the camera industry in that day and age with a, a lot more electronics. They just couldn't keep up and they just weren't set up to do that type of thing. So unfortunately they did go out of business. This particular camera used what's called a coupled rangefinder. Now that basically means that when you look at the back of the camera, you see one eyepiece to look through. So when you look through that eyepiece, you're going to see a framing area. You're going to see an outline that defines, okay, where you have to keep your subject of interest within the boundary of that line. And it has a focusing dot that works in conjunction with this focusing lever on the lens. It does not have a focusing ring. It has a focusing lever. Okay, that adjusts, adjusts your focus. And when you look through, it's a split image type of scenario. So think of it, you put that dot on something that's a vertical line, and if you're in focus, that line looks like this. If it's not in focus, the line is split. And when you move it in focus, then everything lines up perfectly. But if you're off, it splits the image, it moves it. So you have to adjust the focus until everything lines up. And that's how a split focus system works. And that was very common, not only in rangefinder ca cameras, but subsequent uh, single lens reflex cameras that came out. Now, if you're looking to buy a vintage camera like this, a word to the wise. Cameras this old are rarely in good enough condition to use unless you're lucky enough to buy it from someone that knows how to refurbish the cameras, replace any seals that are required, lubricate as required, and calibrate an exposure meter if the camera has one. 
Now this camera does not use a battery. If you look at the bottom where normally you'd see the battery, you only tr see your tripod socket and the button that you push that allows you to rewind your film. And that's it. When you look at the front, other than the, other than the focusing lever, which I warn you if you're going to buy this, is commonly locked frozen because of the lubricants that are in the camera body after 50 plus years and if it hasn't been used and worked it just locks up and you may not be able to break it free so just a word to the wise if you're gonna buy one that's one question that you ask the person does the focus lever move freely another thing that you ask is when I'm shooting at slow shutter speeds does the do the aperture blades close all the way that's another problem with lubricants the shutter speed may look like it works okay if the person say checked it at 1 250th of a second but if you go down to one or two seconds and you do it all of a sudden the shutter does not close all the way and uh, you could see it just kind of like sticking so those are two questions you need to ask before you buy one of these from anybody especially if you're buying on eBay or any of the sites really because most of the people selling that stuff are picking this stuff this was their grandfather's camera it's been sitting in the closet for you know 60 years or they picked it up at a tag sale for five bucks and they think they can turn around and sell it for 200 but they know nothing about cameras and they tell you it's in great shape oh the the focus works and even though they probably didn't even know that this is the focus lever you get my point buyer beware now from the front the other things that you have and I know it's hard to see so I'm going to point to it with a tool here see this lever Okay, I grabbed it with the tool. That's actually a self-timer, mechanical self-timer. And then if you look at the lens itself, you can see the f-stops and you can see the shutter speed. So you got those two rings on the lens. All your adjustments, for the most part, are on the lens. And looking at the top of the camera, you've got your film rewind crank. You have a cold shoe that you can mount a flash on. Back in those days, to hook up your flash, there were no electrical contacts on the flash. You had to have a cable that plugged into a sink port, and that's how you got the flash to trigger. Then you have, obviously, your, your shutter release button. You have your film advance lever, and then you have your frame counter dial, which is on the top. And like we said, nothing on the back, just a single viewfinder and your release lever to open up the back is on the side. So you lift that up and the back will open up. Voila. So when you're buying one of these, you want to make sure all the levers work freely, all the shutting setters, uh, settings work, and, uh, and like I said, that that focusing lever does not, is not stuck. Now, the specs on this camera, the shutter speed is either at bulb setting up to 1 500th of a second. It, as I said, it has a cold, cold shoe for the flash, flash accessories. And it does have a sink port to hook up a cable. And that's on the, that's actually on the side of the lens right here. Um, it does have the mechanical timer. Now it has no ISO adjustments or ASA film speed adjustments at all because it has no battery. It's all mechanical. It does not have an exposure meter. So you have to meter with an external handheld exposure meter, figure out you know what f-stop shutter speed combination you want to use, 
set it on your camera, you know, make your settings, do your focus, and hit the shutter button. And that's it. And this camera has a 45 millimeter f2.8 fixed lens. Now we'll move on to the next one. Okay, so our next camera is the 1967 Minolta AL-F 35mm rangefinder. There you go. Here's what it looks like. Okay. Now this has, this is a, uh, just like the Petri where it has a coupled rangefinder. And I talked to you before that you have a single viewing area on the back. And I'm going to elaborate What's the difference being a, between a coupled and an uncoupled? Coupled is you look through it, you see an outline of where the, the area is that you need to place your subject. You, you have a boundary, you have a border in there, and you focus. And while you're looking, if you adjust your focus, you can see that you're determining your focus looking through this one eyepiece. On an uncoupled, uncoupled range finder, like this vintage Argus C3, this is a bit older to me, this is uh, 1948, circa 1948, you have two places to look through, okay? One is for determining where your, where your subject is, okay? There's no frame line at all, and the other one is where you would adjust the focus knob, which is here. Okay, as you rotate this, it moves the lens. And that has the split image technology as well. But you have to use one for focusing. And you look through the other one for, you know, getting the person in the frame the way you want it before you take the picture. So the coupled ones is where you do everything looking through the one viewfinder. Now, the huge benefit, you know, being a, a few years newer than the Petri, is that this has an exposure meter built into it. So, this has a battery compartment. See, on the bottom, you got the battery, you got the tripod socket, you got the button that you push so that you can rewind your film. That's all that's on the bottom. So, in the case of this camera, it's really shutter priority. And that means you select the shutter speed that you want. And when you look through the viewfinder, you basically have a needle that moves up and down depending on how much light it senses. And here's the eye for the CDS cell that is reading the light that's out there. And that needle, needle goes up and down depending on how much light the sensor is seeing. Now, when you look through the, the rangefinder on the right hand side, the needle's there in whatever position it's in, and then there's a bar, a band that comes down, and it has all your f stops listed. And then you have a highlighted area in red at the top and a highlighted area in red at the bottom. If the needle is in the red at either end, you're not going to be able to get the exposure the way you want it unless you adjust your shutter speed. Now, we will hold the camera. Let's see, how did I do this the last time? I think I did it this way, but no, this way is going to be better. So you have adjustments on this, on this camera 
for shutter speed. And then you have this one that click stops that's actually uh, for adjusting the guide number because another feature this flash has, and I, here I am, you know, going off track a little bit, is you have a hot shoe, a real hot shoe, not a cold shoe. You can sync an electronic flash directly to the body and you can adjust the guide number, which is the range of the distance of how far that flash is going to work from the settings on this camera. And then, you know, rewind here and your release button and your winding lever and uh, indicator of uh, frame counter. So, like I said, it's shutter priority. So as you adjust your, as you adjust the shutter speed, that needle moves up and aligns with an f-stop. And it's just telling you, okay, if you're at 1 25th of a second and it says you're at f4, well, at f4, you know, you don't have a lot of depth of field. So, you have a minimum amount that's going to be in focus in front and behind the subject that you're focusing on. So if you want to be at, you know, F11 or, or higher, then you just adjust your shutter speed until that, that indicator needle lines up with the F-stop that you want. And then you take the picture. Simple as that. Now, for the focusing... That's a very short, instead of having the, the lever on the side, you know, that's just, that's just a ring towards the body of the camera that rotates. And very short throw to go from minimum focus distance, distance to infinity. I mean, you can could, you could see, you're, you're not even a quarter of a turn. And uh, the flash on this, they called it... Um, the easy flash was Nikon's term for the flash technology in this camera. And uh, unlike, however, unlike the previous camera, the Petri, this one does not have a um, manual self-timer at all. It does not have a self-timer. So sometimes, you know, you get, a, you get features that are more advanced but then they sometimes they take something away that was on a camera that was, you know, five years older or more. And you scratch your head and you say, well, why, why didn't they put it on the camera? But that's something you've got to look for even today when you're comparing cameras. You know, one, one has something that you go, oh, that's great. I like it because it has that. But then the more you read, you find out it takes away something that you liked on your previous camera that you used a lot. So... You have to pay attention. That the technology is changing, but sometimes when it changes, it takes something away, and then maybe they come out that with the next model that has a self, has everything this has, plus a little more, plus a self timer. So, um, some of the specs, uh, the shutter speed. It's strange on the, on the shutter speed ring. You actually have a lightning bolt indicating that's your flash setting. Then from there, it's numbered from a thirtieth of a second to one five hundredth of a second. And you have a flash sync on the side of the body, right here. And the ASA range, film speed, which now today's jargon as we call it ISO, which is International Standards Organization, but it has a range of 25 to 500, and it has a 30, 38 millimeter f2.7 lens on it. And like I said, it has that CDS sensor to read your light. Now, some older cameras, cameras older than this, <clears throat> older than, well, the Petri didn't have a, an exposure meter in at all, but some old Raleigh flexes that had um, exposure meters in them, and some rangefinder cameras like this had a big ring. Of, of glass and behind that was a, a selenium cell that read your exposure. If you're going to buy a camera that uses selenium cells, the odds are it either doesn't work or it's not accurate. And you cannot get a new one in any camera that used those cells. They're just not made anymore. So if you have one that doesn't work, uh, you'd have to cannibalize another camera 
and hope that one does. But the likelihood is, even if even if it does for a little while, it's it's going to fail. I mean, you're talking cameras that are that were made in the in the 50s and and in the early 60s. So um, you're going to have to resign your your yourself to the fact that you're going to have that camera as a display camera, or if everything else works perfectly fine you could use a handheld exposure meter and you can get your settings off of that and still use the camera and get good results but you know like I said those those types of cells do not hold up uh, well I have some light meters behind me on the on the shelf that use those kinds of sensors and if they're left laying around where the where the sensor is exposed to light Eventually, it just fries it out. Um, so that's it for, for this particular camera. And as we move on, you're going to see technology changes a little, a little bit more, a little bit more. You know, and we all know what it is like today, right? So we will move on to the next one. Well, this is take two because for whatever reason uh, the file didn't save when I was done. So I'm going to talk faster in case uh, this times out using Photo Booth on my Mac. This is a 1978 Raleigh 35 LED miniature viewfinder camera, not a rangefinder camera, a viewfinder camera. This is not a camera for everyone unless you want to fit it in your pocket. It'll fit in a t-shirt pocket. It'll fit in any kind of purse a woman would have. It, and that's what's great about it. There's only two cameras smaller than this that are 35 millimeter. The Minolta TC-1 and the Minox 35. The lens on this camera actually extends from the body and has a focusing ring that relies on you estimating the distance to your subject and setting it accordingly. You cannot see the focus like you would on those other rangefinder cameras that we talked about because this is a viewfinder camera. So we're going to pop the lens out. You rotate it to lock it. This red button that you see here, you have to be, push this in in order to unlock the lens and push it back against the body. So the only thing you see on the front is that red button and, okay, you can see the shutter speed ring against the body of the camera. Then you have your f-stops ring, which is right here. Then you have another, it's not really a ring, it's just a piece of plastic that has, has the line on it that you line up your f-stop with, and it has two rows of dots, inner set of dots, outer set of dots. We'll talk about that in a second. To change your focus, you have to rotate the very edge, and you have distance in feet and in meters. Feet is in red, meters is in white. Now, so you're, guess, you're guessing how far away your subject is, and that's fine. But this uses what's called zone focusing. You have two opportunities to use zone focusing. If you use it, you can use it at f8. So you adjust your focus to what you think the subject is, say 10 feet away. You line up that 10 with the line that we talked about. And the inner row of dots is going to give you the range of your focus range. That's why they call it zone focusing. If I go to f16, it uses the outer set of dots. So if I set my distance to 20 feet, and I go to F16, which you may or not be able to see this. 
okay, which is where I'm at now, you're actually going to be able to have everything in focus from eight feet to infinity. Now, when you look at the top, you got your film advance lever, which is on the opposite side of the camera than normal. It's on the left hand side when you're holding it in your hand, not on the right. Battery cover, rotatable dial to set your ASA range, your uh, shutter button, which has a collar around it that you can turn to lock it so it doesn't accidentally go off, and you got a little bubble film advance uh, or film indicator, you know, how many shots you're, what shot you're on. And uh, when you look through the viewfinder, you see a framed in area similar to the rangefinder cameras. It does not have an exposure needle. It has three LEDs at the top, which someone like me that wears glasses has one heck of a time seeing. You know, I, I just, I think the battery's kind of dead on this thing, but, you know, so you have three LEDs. You got a red, a green, and a red. The red on the far left is, uh, indicates underexposure. If you're at green, that's where you want to be. If you're, if the red LED on the right lights up, then you're overexposed. So, it's not really a manual, it's not really a shutter or aperture priority camera. You just adjust either or to whatever combination you want, like a manual camera, and you get it so that red LED lights up, and then you just, you make sure that the, the camera's not uh, locked, shutter's not locked, take the picture, rewind. And this was their whole theory. You could take a picture, Rewind quick with the left hand. Take a picture. Rewind real quick. Um, now, the more interesting thing with this camera, and I'm going to push in the red button on the side that I talked about, and I'm going to rotate the, rotate the lens and push it back in so it's collapsed. When you go to load film, the back doesn't swing out like any other camera you've ever seen. You actually take this camera apart in a sense. You look at the bottom, that's freaky. You got your film rewind. You have the button that you push so you can rewind the film. You got your tripod mount. You have a hot shoe. So your flash is upside down <laughs> when you're using it. And there's a collar around this tripod mount that you unlock. And when you unlock it, you slide out that part of the body. comes apart. Now you have where your film chamber is. This opens up. Your, oops. Your film goes across the rails and into the film holder and then you advance the film as required and then you push this down and then you reassemble the cover which I am not gonna stand up to do this but but basically you know here we are you know push it all the way in tighten the knob and that's it. Now, like I said, things that are different with this that might drive you nuts is um, where levers and stuff is. Okay, like I said, you actually have... Um, The shutter speed's not adjusted by a knob on the top like a DSLR or an SLR would be. It's part of the camera body behind the lens mount. You know, against against the lens. Um, 
your f-stop ring doesn't click that drives me nuts it just rotates so you can go from f8 to f11 you can be somewhere in between and they don't click stop um, and um, the ASA film speed settings on the top of the camera like I said showed you how to load the film it's just weird you know you got your hot shoe on the bottom that has no PC sync your ASA uh, range your film speed is 25 to 1600 and it uses a 40 millimeter f3.5 collapsible uh, fixed collapsible lens which is really cool and that's why you can put it in your pocket and um, you know that that pretty much covers it so if you want a compact camera with an exposure meter hey this may be just what you're looking for you just gotta get used to using zone focusing but zone focusing is nothing more than understanding depth of field how much of your how at a certain distance at a certain f-stop what range of focus do you have the subject's 15 feet away is everything from 10 feet to 20 feet in focus it all depends okay on how far away you are from your subject and what your f-stop is so look at a depth of field chart sometime and you can see the relationship between your f-stop and your uh, film plane to subject distance and now we'll move on to the next one So here we are with the next camera and we move from predominantly the rangefinder discussion to uh, single lens reflex cameras full frame so all these are full frame and if you're asking well isn't that the only thing there is no there's there were a few what they called half frame cameras so if you're interested in finding out about them look at the original uh, Olympus pen cameras and uh, very very interesting design and on a, a 36 exposure roll you get 72 pictures and I'll leave it at that I'll let you do some homework now the camera we're going to talk about now which you've already seen some pictures of is a 1972 issued in 1972 the Olympus OM1 SLR and what made this camera mind-boggling for its time simply put it was the smallest the smallest SLR full frame interchangeable lens camera ever made. Period. Well, that's what makes it mind boggling. Mind -boggling. Now, what's a bit strange on this camera versus others? Well, there are quite a few things. First off, we'll look at the bottom. And you have a, a tripod socket, you have a battery compartment, and then you have something else that looks like a battery compartment, but it's really access. You remove that cover when you hook up a uh, winder to this. And here's the electrical contacts for the winder. So you're going, well, where's, where's the button to push in when I want to rewind my film? Ah, that's the first strange or different thing. That is on the front and as you can see right here you got a red R you flip that lever 
and that's in rewind. On this same part of the front, you got a mechanical uh, self timer, and you have this is your mirror lockup. So this is the first camera and we've talked about with a mirror lockup. And you use that when you're worried about vibration from the shutter mirror moving out of the way before you take a picture. So if you're doing a long exposure, you can lock the mirror up before you take the picture so you don't get that mirror slap, as they call it. Uh, so this camera has it. Nothing that we talked about before had that. On the other side, you've got the, uh, the sync port, which has a switch. And so, uh, some, some cameras have two sync ports. One's labeled FP, one's labeled X. Some just have X sync, like the newer cameras. Eventually, they go, well, we're not going to try to be compatible with old flash bulb setups. So we're just going to offer the X sync only. And, uh, and many of the hot shoes on camera will have an X on them because it's X-Sync. But this has a, actually has a, uh, a, a lever that you move and you can switch between either modes. So that way they only have one connector on there instead of two. Now, another thing that's strange is you're looking at this, this top rotating knob and I know what you're thinking. Oh, that's just my shutter speed. Not on this camera, it's not. Your shutter speed is a ring. Is this ring that's right up to the body. It's part of the body. Your flange mount for your lens, you know, that's right in line with your flange mount is right in front of that. So there's your shutter speeds. Now, you don't have a lens release button like you have on other SLR cameras. Every lens made, try to get my hand out of the way here, has, has a tang. See that little protrusion there? There's one on each side. So you have to grab those with your fingers and squeeze them to rotate the lens. And the lens rotates opposite versus other cameras of the era. So to put it on, you're actually turning the camera in a different direction than you would on any of the other cameras, and vice versa, taking it off, it's backwards. At least in your mind, it's backwards. Another thing that's strange, you see the hot shoe. You go, huh, oh, no big deal, every camera has a hot shoe. <laughs> no, that's not true. This camera, the hot shoe is optional. You look at the back, you see how it says fix and it has an arrow. You have to place this part on top of the pentaprism and there, and it's almost like a tapped screw. It screws into the body and you tighten it up, you know, with this little wheel here. And there's your hot shoe. But you, you did not get it standard when you bought the camera. You had to pay extra for that. Now, the other thing that's strange, and we'll look at the, uh, we'll, I'll hold the camera this way, we'll do a top view. You have the rewind lever. Your on-off switch is on the left-hand side when you're holding the camera in your hand and you're looking at it from the back. So your on-off switch normally is on the right-hand side. In this case, it's on the left-hand side. And when you look at the dial that you would think on the right, should have been your shutter speeds it's actually your ASA and then you have a release button that little that little protrusion that little button you have to push that down in, norm, in, in order to turn this dial and then you have your shutter release button and you have your film advance lever so that, that's that's normal so <clears throat> that um, that release button obviously is something new. Cameras uh, in the earlier days, um, like an old Minolta, uh, the old, um, which we will be talking about, there is no release button. And, and the one on the top is for adjusting your shutter speed and it, and it just has click, click stops. 
So, I mean, theoretically, can you really bump that to move it? I would find that very, very unlikely that that would happen. But a lot of cam camera manufacturers in the later years started push, putting these buttons that you have to push to rotate the knob, and they do that to this very day on some of the knobs that are on the left-hand side uh, for setting your frames per second and, and other, other things on digital SLRs, and you have to push a button to release it, to turn it. The, um, <clears throat> it's just a very unique camera. Now, when you, it, ha it does have a battery, but the battery is for the exposure meter, and it's not LEDs, okay? It is a, um, it's not even technically, it's not a match needle, it's just a needle, and basically you have a frame, and the, the needle has to be in the middle of the frame to be properly exposed. If the needle is going up higher, it's a half a stop or a stop over. If it goes lower, it's a half a stop or a stop or more under. And in this case, the, the needle and that indicating zone is on the left-hand side, where on all other cameras, all your exposure information is on the right-hand side. And there is no, uh, there is no other information on this camera to, to give you any, you know, what your f-stop is or what your shutter speed is. So basically, you know, you have your, your focusing screen, you have your meter, and, and that's all you have. Your depth of field preview, as weird as it is, the same, I can find it here, <laughs> that same little tang that you would push along with the other one to take the lens off. You push in the one that would be on your right hand side and that's your depth of field preview button. Now just going over some of the highlights, it has, you know, it has obviously the, the hot shoe. That's optional. That's X-Sync. And uh, it does have a PC sync connection that is switchable between FP and X-Sync. The ASA range film speed is from 25 to 1600. Obviously, unlike the other bodies we talked about, it's not a fixed lens. That's what, what made SLRs uh, so attractive when they came out were, were the fact that they were interchangeable lens cameras. So you had a wide variety of lenses to put on them, from fisheye lenses to telephotos to zooms, whatever you wanted. Obviously, in, in the, you know, they call it back in the day, most cameras were, were paired up with, uh, you know, at the stores, at your local department store or whatever, where they had a small camera department, would be paired up with, a, with what was considered a standard lens, which was a 50 millimeter lens. And usually it was like an F1.8 or an F2. If you paid a little extra, you could get a 1.4. Um, it has the mechanical self timer. It has the mirror lockup, which a lot of cameras didn't have. Now, this whole back is removable. Now it has the typical, you know, lift up on the the rewind crank, and you know, opens up the back. Okay, but you could take this you could take this back off, and you could put on what they call a a record uh, data back, uh, which, I don't know, I think it's kind of gimmicky. I mean, it would imprint, you know, settings data on your, on your picture. <laughs> I, I never got into that kind of stuff. And obviously, like I said before, you got the contacts, so it accepts either a motor drive or a winder. So most companies, the difference between a motor drive and a winder, the winder would be less frames per second. And it was really just to advance the film so you didn't have to use the film advance lever. You could sit there and go click, it'd be click, whir, click, whir, and move ahead. And you didn't have to, you know, use your thumb and move the advance lever. Whereas the, um, 
you know, when you got into the, the motor drive, you had a, a faster frames per second rate. And it wasn't fast back then. It was a wider, might have been two frames a second. The motor drive might have been four frames per second. But with the winder, it didn't do anything to give you a better grip. The motor drive had the handle, had a nice grip. It probably it had extra buttons on it. And at one point, it was just, you know, a shutter button on the top. And, of course, as we know down the road, you know, you ended up where if you went vertical, you had a set of buttons up there on, on you know, cameras in the future. And the shutter can be fired without the battery installed because the battery is just for the meter. So the camera still works without a battery in a pinch. You use the Sunny 16 rule or use an external exposure meter and you could take pictures with this camera all day long with no battery. And um, the ASA range, film speed range, the camera is 6 to 3200. And, uh, and, you know, and, and that's pretty much it. But, you know, what sold this camera was, you know, when people say, well, you know, I, I want to get a Sony a7R 4 nowadays. It's nice and small. Or I want to get an A1. It's smaller than a Z9 or whatever. Well, this, this, was, this was the solution back in the SLR days if you wanted a small uh, SLR. Obviously, if you want a real small care camera, you get you get the non-SLR uh, fixed lens uh, Raleigh, and you could fit it in your shirt pocket. So we will move on to the next one. The next camera we're going to talk about is the 1971 Minolta SRT100 SLR. The best way to describe this camera is it's a minimalist type of camera. Full manual controls, no shutter priority, no aperture priority, no program mode. Only thing that makes it slightly, slightly modern is it does have an exposure meter and it has what they call a match needle type so your needle moves up and down based on exposure and to set the camera properly you adjust either your shutter speed or your f-stop to move a separate needle that is in there that has a circle around it so it almost looks like a magnifying glass so you adjust your shutter speed or your f-stop so that the the needle with the circle moves up and down and lines lines up with the needle that changes with the amount of light and that's why they call it a match needle you're taking the needle that only moves when you change your f-stops and you're lining it up with the one that's reacting to the cds cell and the camera and when they line up then theoretically you have the proper exposure now the shutter can be fired without the battery installed um, because the battery is just for the meter. Now future cameras, they got so much electronics in them, uh, eventually if you didn't have a battery in the camera, you couldn't even you, you couldn't use it, period. You couldn't fire the shutter because it just wouldn't work. But on these older cameras, yeah, you could just, okay, my battery died, <clears throat> get out my handheld meter, Follow the Sunny 16 rule, whatever. Figure it out for yourself, what you want to set up, and just take the picture. Now, on the front of the camera, here's, here's what it looks like. Very, very simple. <laughs> what do you see on the front? You got your, your lens release button. Okay, you don't push it in. You actually push it, and it slides over, and then you can release the lens. 
Then you've got your depth of field preview button, which is on the camera body, unlike the Olympus where it was actually part of the lens. You have your your sync, and here's where you, and here's a camera that has the two sync ports where you could plug in the cable, either FP or X. So that's it. You know, you look at the bottom. There's nothing for motor drives or anything. You have your tripod socket. You have your battery under here. You have your uh, button that you push in so you can wind, rewind your film. And then you have this other uh, switch, three-way switch, that it's knurled on the outside so you can take your thumb and move it easily. And it just turns on your exposure meter. The meter's on, off, or it has BC for a battery check. You put it in battery check and you look through the viewfinder, the needle's going to be in a certain position. The manual tells you oh, if it's if it's in this position, then it's then you know the battery's good. So it's a no-nonsense camera that really gets back to the basics. You know, in, in that same time frame when people love the Pentax K1000. I mean basic solid cameras and a lot of people you know they they discount Minolta as like oh they weren't nothing Canon was so much better Nikon was so much better oh that's a bunch of malarkey I mean Minolta made some of the best lenses you could buy they made fantastic glass they had great bodies and they had technology that was that came out before anybody else and what's interesting is, you know, you, people could joke about Kodak, oh, they really screwed up when they figured, well, we'll sell film forever and we're not going to go digital even though we came out with the first digital camera. Uh, and you say, well, that that wasn't didn't work out too well for them, did it? Well, you know, uh, they're not the first ones that could shake their head and say they messed up. Leica, uh, if you know it or not, the R-series cameras from Leica back in the day was a, a partnership between Minolta and Leica. Minolta did because Minolta, Minolta had advanced cameras with a lot, of, a lot of electronics and Leica really didn't do that kind of stuff. So they they, they joined forces with Minolta to make uh, the R-series um, Leica SLRs. And, uh, but here's the kicker. Leica was developed the first autofocus technology for uh, cameras and they sold the patent to Minolta so Minolta in turn ended up coming out with the first camera that was had an autofocus lens on it and it coulda shoulda been Leica but they felt if you can't shoot and focus manually you're not a good photographer I'm sure they regret that decision uh, now now we look at the top you have a uh, a cold shoe, not a hot shoe, no electronic capabilities. Your uh, winder for your film, and here you have your shutter speed. Let me see if I can get this so I can even see it. <laughs> I'm not doing a good job here. Okay, you can see the shutter speeds, and then you see like a little window with a number in it. Well, that's your ISO or your ASA. And you just rotate the knob to change the shutter speed. If you want to change the ISO, the outer ring of that knob lifts up and then you turn it and that changes the ISO. And then you have your rewind lever and you have your film counter window. And that's it. You could, you could say it's as dumb as it gets or it's as simple as it gets. But it is, it is one heck of a good camera. And this was given to me by uh, my old neighbor who we're still, you know, we're good friends with, lives close to us. And he gave it to me and I sent it out and I had it repaired and, and cleaned and, and uh, the light meter calibrated. And it's built like a tank. It's a great camera. Now we'll, um, the ISO uh, ASA range is 6 to 3200. Obviously interchangeable lenses has a depth of field preview button and other than that it doesn't really have any bells and whistles whatsoever but it just plain works okay
to the next clip. Another camera, <clears throat> excuse me, that caught my eye when I was young was a 1972 Fujika ST801 SLR. Now, this was the first SLR that utilized LEDs for the exposure meter versus just a needle or the one that has the match needle system. The viewfinder displayed basically an outline that had an area defined where the LED needed to show up to give you the proper exposure. If the LED was above this area, it was overexposed. If it was below it, it was underexposed. In the viewfinder, you could actually see an indicator of what your shutter speed was. Now, you couldn't see what your f-stop was, but you could see what your shutter speed was. And we all know as time went on and cameras advanced even more, eventually you got to the point where you could see all your camera setting information within the viewfinder so that you could finally take a picture without having to take your eye away from it to check a setting or change a setting because you could, you could do it by feel and you knew where everything was and you could get the, get the shot. So... Because you could see the shutter setting in the viewfinder, it was basically a shutter priority system along with being able to get used in manual mode. So the standard stuff on the front, okay, I'll hold it here, is uh, depth of field preview button. So instead of being on the side like the Minolta that you pushed in, it's just a round button that you push towards the body. You got your mechanical self timer. On the other side, you got your, your FP and your X sinks. Okay, and then down here is your, there's an arrow. That's your uh, shut, that's your lens release button. So you can take the lens off. Now, we'll just go to the back quick. And the iCup, I, cup, I found one online that fit, didn't have one on it. Uh, and that's your battery. So instead of the battery, battery being on the bottom, it's actually on the back. And the bottom, you, really, you just have your button, as usual, so that you can rewind your film and your tripod socket. And what's interesting is, depending on the cam camera manufacturer and how they had to build their camera, it's more ideal if the tripod socket is centered in the body of the camera, but there are a lot of uh, cameras where the socket is offset to one side or, or the other. Um, we look at the top. You got your film rewind crank. You got your hot shoe, which has the letter X on it. We always talk about X sync. Well, that's, that's your X sync. And then you have your, um, your shutter speed dial. You have your shutter release, which you can turn and lock so you, so you, can, so you don't inadvertently take a picture. And you have your, your rewind lever. So that's the, that's the camera in a nutshell. Like I said, it's got the hot shoe X sync, has the, the two uh, ports for either FP or X sync with the cable. Your ASA uh, film speed range is 25 to 3200. Interchangeable lens camera, of course, and the mechanical self timer. This what this this camera is made like a tank as well. This this camera I had for many years, and and it was a fantastic camera. 
I love shooting with this camera. Um, and it, you know, it's it's pretty heavy for the size. It, it really is. Of course, in know in that era of cameras, they were all fairly heavy. You know, we all complain about how heavy cameras are now. You know, go back 50 years and then and then stop complaining. <laughs> But uh, that's really it for this. I mean, it, it's pretty simple, and, and, you know, it has a little sticker that says LED. Uh, so, you know, it uses LEDs for the exposure meter. And, uh, but it, it's, it's very, very nice. It's, it's a very good camera. And, and there weren't a lot of Fujika uh, SLRs, per se. I mean, they made a handful, but, you know, it wasn't like they had a product line like a, like a Nikon or a Canon, that's for sure. And, uh, and that's it for this one. Now the last camera we're going to talk about, I believe was my last SLR that I ever owned because in 2002, Nikon came out with the D100 uh, digital SLR and that was my first digital SLR and I, I went on to eventually get the D200, the D300, the D850 and, and then I went mirrorless with the Z9. Um, so that's, that's kind of the history of my cameras, but this Minolta XGM is, is a beast of a camera. Yeah, it's not simple like the SRT 100 series of cameras and, uh, yeah, it needs a battery, but let me tell you, this camera is as fun it's just great, and if you could, and if you could find one of these used, you would have a fantastic time shooting with this camera. It, it's really, really good. And my cousin at the time, and this, like I said, circa 1981, my cousin uh, had a Canon AE1 program that came out. So, you know, we started the camera wars at an early at an early age, uh, but it was all in good fun. And you know, Canon that Canon camera was obviously phenomenal and sold like gangbusters. This was the last in the XG series of cameras that Minolta made. This was their, their highest level one that they made in that series. And um, just like the Fujika ST801 that I just talked about, this utilizes an LED in the viewfinder as well. But instead of having the LV LED just have to be in, be in a circuit, certain location, okay within the viewfinder to say that's the right exposure when you look at this one you have a series of LEDs that all line up with a shutter speed it's on the right hand side not on <laughs> and the metering system is not on the left like the OM-1 so you have LEDs that go up and down and to the right is all the shutter speeds that this camera will do and so it is a fully manual camera and it also has aperture priority so that means you could set the aperture and the camera will select the shutter speed for you and you want to know what the shutter speed is you look through the viewfinder and it's gonna say okay the red light the LEDs lit up next to 1 500th of a second that's that's my shutter speed and obviously you can you can always shoot manual and you're gonna get that same recommendation depending on what your your f-stop is and then you could choose to ignore that setting and change your f-stop <clears throat> or change your shutter speed in case you have to do you know if you have to do exposure compensation but there is an easier way to do that which we'll get to in a second now on this camera when you look through the viewfinder obviously you can see the shutter speed but it also had the ability 
where when you look through it at the very bottom of the viewfinder you could see the f-stop so finally I had a camera that I could look through and I could make adjustments as needed adjust the wheel on the top for my shutter speed turn the, the, the aperture ring on my lens and I could do it all without taking my eye off the subject and I can see what my settings are and take a picture so I had to wait that long before I had a camera body that could do that um, so you you look at the front and I'm gonna tilt the camera this way that's actually where you hook up your old style mechanical shutter release screws into that your sync button is on the other side buried here down in the corner so there's your sync button uh, this is your lens release button and here's your depth of field preview button you know just like the old SRT 100 now you go to the other side this is where it gets interesting you say well what's this funny looking thing here well that's an LED and you can I don't know if it'll show up in the video or not I could push this button that releases the the knob you have to have that release button to be able to turn your shutter speed knob well I push just the button down and see how the light lights up well that tells me that the battery's good and the other thing that's cool and we'll see if I could demonstrate it and we will let's see what we could do here oh it has um, first I'll go over what what's on the top so you have you have your rewind rewind lever but you have that sits into another knob basically and this knob does two things it has a release button here and here's your arrow it has exposure compensation okay plus or minus two stops then if you lift this outer ring up you turn it and it changes your ISO you have a hot shoe conventional hot shoe X sync you have your indicator line that lines up with in this case the A is lined up which means I'm in aperture priority mode I have my rewind lever I've got an on off switch for the camera on the top and I and there's the re, and there's the release lever here you know there's the LED lighting up again and then I have a the film counter and this 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 one here uh, it's called like the safe film indicator it if you'll see a, a line go across in here if you loaded the film properly it, you'll see it move across and you'll know that uh, you threaded it properly uh, in the back of the camera so that was that was something that was neat and then the bottom you have your battery you have your tripod mount you have terminals for either a winder or a motor drive you have your button that you push for your um, be able to rewind your film uh, so I mean this this camera it really in the day just really knocks your socks off um, the ISO range is 25 to 1600 interchangeable lenses obviously electronic self timer I'm gonna see if I can turn the camera on here and let me Okay, I am going to, there's a little plastic piece here on the side of the camera that you flip up and that enables your electronic self timer. So I'm going to push the shutter button down. Oh, let me try that again. <laughs> I hope the battery ain't dead. There 
Let me try that again. Okay, it'll blink slowly and then it speeds up at the end before it takes the picture. It's a little erratic because I don't think the capacitor's charged up enough yet because it hasn't been used in probably 30 years or so. Um, but it does work. Um, and even the occasional time where the LED doesn't do its normal blinky thing, uh, the, uh, it does trip the shutter. Um, so something that I'll have to watch. Um, but I think it'll once it gets used a little bit more, it'll be fine. Um, and uh, what else we got? You got, um, like I said, motor drive winder capability. Oh, the, the touch switch. Most cameras of this generation, you had to push the shutter button halfway down. If you had an LED type of exposure meter, you had to push the button halfway down to activate the LEDs. This was like, I think they called it an electromagnetic shutter release. But basically, as long as your, your finger wasn't too dry and you had a little finger oil on it, you, when you touched the top lightly, you didn't even have to push down on it. The LEDs would light up in the display. And that way you could get your exposure and you're not pushing the thing really halfway down until you want to take the picture. So that was a cool thing. Uh, that was something that nobody else had at the time either. Um, and um, I think it, you, you could also get the data back, you know, for the back of the camera. And some, some cameras had this little like slot that you could slip in you know the tab on the end of your film cart uh, film box so you knew what film you put in the camera so some had it and kept it for a while some got rid of it after time some of them had like a little wheel that you could turn so you could set it to adjust what film you had in the camera it didn't physically do anything but it gave you a a mental reminder of what you had in the camera and that's it I hope you enjoyed this video I think you can see the progression in the technology as time went on with 35 millimeter cameras and, and obviously a few oddballs that were out there that were great cameras, but let's just say more interesting uh, as well. Um, now after Minolta XGM, technology continued to improve on all the brands of cameras and eventually uh, like the Canon AE-1 program was shutter priority with a program mode and manual. And this XGM was aperture priority with a manual mode. And eventually, you know, pretty much everybody ended up having cameras that had aperture priority, shutter priority, and a program mode. So that was like the next evolution. So, you know, every every new camera cycle, which might have been... You know, it depended on the brand. Like sometimes one brand would, the, the ones that always were leapfrogging, you know, were always, you know, they always said, well, Canon and Nikon are always leapfrogging each other. But, you know, th this guy sometimes would leap ahead of both of them. <laughs> um, so, you know, now you have all those modes I just talked about, aperture priority, shutter priority, program modes. All those things are common on, on obviously, the, was common on the, on the DSLR cameras as well as the mirrorless cameras. And of all these cameras I talked about, I, I personally owned a Minolta SRT-101, which was very similar to the SRT-100 that my neighbor gave me. I owned the Fujika that I showed you. I owned the OM-1. I owned this XGM. So I've basically been trying to buy working examples of camera bodies that I used in the say 60s through the year 2002 when the D100 first came out, uh, D100 digital camera first came out from Nikon. And then that was the first time that and since that I stuck to a brand. So I've been shooting Nikon since the D100 days. Um, but prior to that, as you could tell uh, from this presentation, I shot a lot of different brands. I didn't have a lot of money, you know. I was a young young guy. I didn't have a high-paying job, so 
you know, I might have only had the body with the quote unquote standard 50 millimeter lens and possibly one or two other lenses. I might have had a, a wide angle, like a 28 millimeter was very common, 28 millimeter wide angle and possibly a, a small uh, zoom lens. And that's all I ever had. So it wasn't like when I was switching brands that I had 10 lenses invested into, into it. So I didn't get to that point until I got into the Nikon ecosystem. And now uh, I'm pretty deep in it and have been for a long time. So I'm not changing anytime soon. And we'll leave it at that. So as I always tell you, enjoy life, capture some of it. And don't be afraid, but be cautious and ask a lot of questions before you buy any vintage camera. Because another thing I want to say is when you buy a camera even from the 70s, okay, that's over 50 years old. And the foam that's on the mirror that helps dampen it so it doesn't like make a real loud noise when it goes up. The mirror dampening foam and the foam in the back of the camera that keeps light from getting into the back because these are not light tight like some of the cameras were in the 50s that were just, you know, the tolerances were so tight and the way they were made, they didn't need any kind of a, a gasket material or foam or anything else. They just didn't leak light, didn't get in there. Uh, basically, unless somebody states that they've done it, you have to assume that you're going to have to send any camera that you buy even if it physically works, you buy it and it's in the 70s era, 80s era, you're going to have to send it out and get new new dampening material on the mirror installed or and the foam in the back where the uh, film chamber is. And that's a given. And you can buy kits and you can try doing it yourself or you can find somebody. Um, I found somebody that worked out great on my... my uh, my neighbor's old SRT 100. I'd use them again in a heartbeat, but it's hard to find a good guy. And if you do, stick with them and it, let them do the dirty work, you know. And in the meantime, they'll lubricate the camera. They'll check it out functionality. They'll they'll adjust your exposure meter and make sure that it, it meets the, uh, the specs uh, when the camera was brand new. So until we meet again, Enjoy life, capture some of it, like I say, and hey, take your pick. You know, use different stuff. Don't be afraid of film. <laughs> film is not the enemy. Take care. And if you like this video, please please give me a thumbs up. Uh, give me a, give me a like, share, comment, and uh, and comment good or bad. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.